All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not All Propaganda is Art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, July 1985, French intelligence operatives sink the flagship of the Greenpeace fleet, the Rainbow Warrior, at the port of Auckland, New Zealand, as the ship was on her way to protest against a planned French nuclear test. The Rainbow Warrior was a massive ship that had been acquired by Greenpeace in 1977 and was active in supporting a number of anti-whaling, anti-seal hunting, and anti-nuclear testing and nuclear waste dumping campaigns during the late 70s and the early 80s. It was being deployed in the South Pacific because that was the site of a lot of nuclear testing. And here was the French government intervening to sink the ship while it was docked in Auckland. Seven agents worked together to place mines on the Rainbow Warrior, detonated seven minutes apart, just around midnight, the ship sank, one person died, and the French government, no surprise maybe, denied involvement for a while. A few months later, the French prime minister would finally admit, quote, the truth is cruel, he said. Agents of the French Secret Service sank this boat. They were acting on orders. So here to discuss the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior and Greenpeace and the anti-nuclear movement, as well as the legacy of environmental movements like Greenpeace and what the Rainbow Warrior was up to, is Nicole Hammer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. Hello, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson is still overseas, not able to join us for this one, but back for one more episode is Adam McKay, director of Don't Look Up, The Big Short, Anchorman, uh, this podcast we did, Death at the Wing, and... Adam, maybe by the time this episode airs, your role as campaign manager for Morris the Cat in 1992 will be on your IMDb page. (laughs) People can go check that out. Um, But a a more serious topic here. So thank you for thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks you guys for having me. I remember when this happened. I'm old enough that I was a conscious human being who was starting to kind of politically wake up, and this was on my radar. I mean. You know, I worked for Greenpeace in, I think it was 1990. I worked for the Greenpeace office out of Chicago Mm -hmm. and used to do door-to-door campaigning, information, activist work for them for about like five months. I think I did it for, and people forget because Greenpeace now is kind of a, a dusty institution that's been around forever, but they were not messing around in the 70s into the 80s and the early 90s was when they started to kind of become kind of establishment um so yeah that that story of the sinking of of that boat was was big i i definitely remember it and i remember i was very conscious for the anti nuke Mm -hmm. movement and uh that was big big i mean if anything it's a pretty good parallel to what's going on now with the climate emergency, although obviously the climate emergency in its full realization seems much, much closer to happening than than uh, the nuclear threat, although it's always still there. But I remember the movies. I remember the marches, the protests, the concerts. And it was kind of incredible because they worked. Yeah, uh, it really did So, yeah, this was a big, big movement. And once again, what's remarkable about it, because I think we live in such a kind of jaded, cynical society where 
the messaging is always, what does it matter? You can't do anything. And it's like, no, you actually can. Yeah. And Greenpeace was also doing amazing stuff where they would, and there were a bunch of orgs that were sending boats out to block whaling ships from killing whales. And there's amazing footage out there online of this happening because the whales really were like an inch away from extinction. Yeah. Like people I'm forget. I mean, my memory of Greenpeace is the is these big ships, but also those little Zodiac kind of almost inflatable boats going out there and just like blockading giant whaling ships. Um, and but you know the visuals of it was was so stunning. But Nikki, do you have do you have memories of this or thoughts on this? You know, I I don't necessarily have memories of Greenpeace in the eighties. What I'm really struck by, especially in that story, Adam, of the. Um, the sort of evolution of Greenpeace is that the 70s and 80s are this period of remarkable environmental activism. But by the 1980s, there is a fairly effective conservative pushback to that activism that begins to talk about eco-terrorism and begins to present as a threat this idea that, oh, it's not just environmentalists who want to um, celebrate Earth Day, but it's these eco-terrorists who want to um, kill people and destroy your jobs and all of these different things. And so growing up in the Reagan era, that was really how I was hearing about Greenpeace from people like Rush Limbaugh, um, who was talking about it as this uh, sort of terrorist organization. And what's important about that is that it wasn't just limited to the U.S. right, right? I mean, that's the kind of mindset that the French government has to have in order to uh, rationalize the idea of blowing up a ship that Greenpeace is, is using to stop some of these uh, nuclear tests. I think Nikki's spot on with that. I think there was, we, we've delved into this, you know, with the, the podcast that Jody and I did, The Death at the Wing. We went deep, deep into the cultural shifts that happened during the 80s. And, you know, the big one was, and it was happening very quietly, was that the oil companies knew that we were headed towards a, a climate collapse. And their initial response with the scientists was, let's fix this. Let's deal with this. But then when Reagan got into office and the big thing he did was he, people forget this, he slashed the top tax rate from something like 66% to like 27%. So... Once that money faucet was turned on and once the CEOs and the board members and the shareholders knew that there was a different game, they were now triple word score on the Scrabble board, it changed everything. So, yeah, Nikki, you're right. I remember they marginalized the environmental movement. They were like, oh, the spotted owl, you're going to lose jobs for some stupid owl tree hugger. I remember the phrase <laughs> tree hugger was a big thing like a hippie girl hugging a tree which by the way in 2022 i would love to see <laughs> i also think that the 80s are remarkable for how effective the environmental activism was in that era at least not just the negative story of the rollback although that's in some ways the winning nar narrative but when you think about the switch away from cfcs in order to deal with the um hole in the ozone layer you think about the anti-nuclear movement these are really hopeful antecedents because they are moments in which activists were able to change multiple national governments in order to um, affect change based on environmental arguments. You know, nothing, uh, the, a change in a country or a world culture, a change in the way a government interacts with big moneyed interest is a lot like turning an aircraft carrier takes a long time and but you can see the trend lines start to shift and i remember the 80s were an odd mixture of like you just said very successful activism with at the same time a wall of pushback coming and kind of a shift and in the middle of that was greenpeace yeah um I want to get to some of the details of this bombing because they're remarkable. But, I, but on this, this sort of nexus between private corporations and activists and governments, I mean, Adam, do you do you have thoughts on the fact that like so many stories of Greenpeace and this one in particular, you know, it's going up against a government. It's not Exxon bombing Greenpeace. It's a it's a government, you know, and I and I wonder kind of in terms of 
climate activism now and environmental activism now, where do you see the balance between going after private corporations versus going after the governments that have sort of been asleep at the at the wheel? Yeah, I mean, that that is a large, we could literally talk about that question for four hours. I, I just spoke with Steve Donziger the other day, who's the attorney that represented the nation of Ecuador against Chevron and then was prosecuted by Chevron. The federal government declined to prosecute Steve Donziger, and yet the corporation was still able to get a special prosecutor appointed. So I think the question of how do governments interact with big money corporations, which we know are a part of the way we live, I mean, we're always going to have big business to some degree. And I mean, if you look at the first Iraq war, Bush Sr. almost nakedly admitted he was going into Kuwait to protect oil. And there's been other times where we're a little more slippery about it. Um, so, yeah, the French government, I mean, God, though, that is really unusual. I've heard stories in the last five, six years where the U.S. government has fed information uh, from the NSA and for their surveillance uh massive apparatus to companies yeah. to oil companies so that still happens um so yeah but, but, that that question is huge but in terms of protest um and sort of raising the alarm i mean do you feel like right now in in an attempt to mount protest around the climate emergency is it really talking about governments or is it talking about private corporations or is it, you know what's the mix between the two I mean, I would say in the United States now, almost without exaggeration, there are a few dozen people still fighting the good fight in D.C., but on and on and on, there's a massive apparatus uh, in D.C. that has essentially fused the government with the corporate interests. You know, there was a study from Princeton in 2014 that showed that the will of the people has no statistical bearing in the United mm -hmm. States towards policy outcome, that it's entirely big money. Um, so I, it's not just me saying that this has been, and I, I think we all can feel that too. I think we all know that's true. So when you get into that kind of realm and there's always been overlap and crossover and the French government consciously blowing up the boat from Greenpeace is a great example. The thing we've got to be afraid of right now is they're starting to jail peaceful climate activists with harsh sentences. And that's a great example of the government acting as an arm Man. for the corporations. And you're seeing that more and more. So on the incident itself, some of the details from that night are kind of stunning and, and very, I think, you know, cinematic in whatever way. I mean, there was a birthday party on the ship that night for one of the members of the crew. And during the birthday party, we later discover that there is a French spy watching all the proceedings and then when the birthday party breaks up and there's fewer people on the deck that's when two divers swim across the auckland port and place the mines on the hull of the ship and then swim away and one of the just most amazing details from all of this is that those two french spies who, pl who planted the bombs their cover was that they were on a honeymoon. Uh, they were a couple on a honeymoon, and they continued their honeymoon for the next couple of days. They kept it up. They took advantage of the of the honeymoon ruse to to stay on honeymoon for a couple of days, even after blowing up this ship. And one photographer, as we said, had gone down to retrieve some equipment when the bomb exploded at around midnight and 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 drowned. Uh, the rest of the crew was off was off the ship at that point. I think it's also worth sitting with that this is a government that's doing this, that's yeah. blowing up the ship and how baldly illegal it is. Um, you know, they're in New Zealand territory. New Zealand and Australia had actually sued France um, in the International Court of Justice in the early 1970s in order to try to get them to stop doing nuclear testing in the South Pacific because France didn't want to blow up nuclear weapons in its own backyard. So it goes halfway across the world, it's blowing up all of these weapons. And the international court says, yeah, France, you need to stop. And France doesn't do it. So they're already breaking the law around nuclear testing to begin with. And then you have Greenpeace coming in and saying, you know, hey, we're going to try to stop you from nuclear testing. But they're also there on a humanitarian mission. They're there to rescue indigenous people from these islands that have been 
poisoned and irradiated by all of this nuclear testing. And it's at this moment that France decides to blow up their boat. So it's just like the the good guy, bad guy lines could not be drawn any more clearly in this situation. Horrible. I mean, did you guys hear the story about the undercover agent from Scotland Yard? This was about six, seven years ago, who went undercover in the climate activist community and deep undercover and ended up having relationships with these women that were like long term relationships. And by the way, in the typical fashion, you saw this a lot with the Black Panthers in the 60s and 70s. The undercover agents would always be the guys pushing for violence. And that was exactly the case with this. He was the guy always pushing people to go further. It was a very peaceful movement, lovely people. And this guy went and had like two, like over the course of like three, four years, had like long-term relationships with people, got like nonviolent people arrested, created situations that were kind of jacked up uh, and then had people arrested So I think we're going to see a lot more of this. I think you're already seeing the stiffer sentences, what happened to Donzinger and like, and I think a playbook is forming Hmm. that's going to get really scary as the climate, which we know is, is, it's intensifying so much faster than we thought. I think uh, in opposition, you're going to see governments that are already 70% owned by big oil uh, roll over to these kind of demands. Yeah. So I want to I want to get your thoughts on kind of where we are now on, on on that front. But just to wrap up some of the details from this story, as I said, you know, in September '85, the French Prime Minister finally admits that they had done this. In '87, France paid eight point one six million dollars to Greenpeace in damages, which helped finance another ship. Um, the Original Rainbow Warrior was taken out and, and, and sunk and serves as a fish sanctuary now, which I think is, is fitting. Um, yeah. The agents involved, you know, they're out there. They've apologized in 2015. You know, someone said that the one of the agents said that it has sort of weighed on his conscience for this whole time. And um, French prime ministers have kind of offered apologies a- a- along the way. But, you know, um, on this moment now, Adam, you started to get into it. But can you highlight kind of efforts that feel like in the spirit of this and and that i mean you know stuff that feels like it is really taking it to the most powerful forces and in also a way i mean i think we touched on this a little bit but you know i think greenpeace had a sort of cultural cachet in a really positive way for much of the 80s and i'm just curious if you sort of see those those strains in any of the movements that are out there now oh yeah i don't think there's any question you know extinction rebellion just stop oil insulate Britain. Uh, These groups are coming fast and uh, they are using the exact same kind of playbook, which is peaceful, but dramatic and loud civil disobedience. The insulate Britain movement was tremendously successful. And to the point where a couple months after they really made their noise, the government started realizing, oh, we need to insulate Britain. And then there came out a leak of a discussion with inside the British government where they were like, we actually do need to insulate Britain, but we can't call it that (laughs) because then the activists will feel too good. Um, So no, there, there's a a burgeoning movement. A lot of them are young people. I've been meeting and working with some of them. I mean, these are teenagers, people in their early twenties. The sad part of this story is the fact that these big environmental groups like Greenpeace, Sierra Club, there's a bunch of them, NRDC, were all incredible groups when they started. But slowly they've been sort of like half devoured by the system and they kind of became incrementalists, uh, you know, working too much from within. You know, I think one thing we know now is it's almost impossible to change the system from within. No one's really ever pulled it off. And I think these orgs really kind of fooled themselves into thinking they could do that. You know, I do wonder to some extent, like part part of the reason I think some of these groups become a little stale is, is a sort of centrist 
uh, DNA, as you describe, uh, part of it is just generational, right? Um, you can only stay sort of on the cutting edge for so long. I do wonder, though, how much the anti-nuke movement and then just sort of like old school, like species conservation, those were so at the center of the movements. And I wonder how much it just became harder to pivot towards the real core climate disaster stuff that is just at the edge, at the front edge of things I, now. I, I... I think the sort of decline of those old dinosaur environmental groups is really like actually very easy to trace. <laughs> and it's just tons of corporate donations. Yeah. Like they just got bought and they fooled themselves much like the democratic party. They fooled themselves into thinking you could take this kind of dirty, you know, lucre and still kind of be okay. And and I think everything we're learning right now is you can't. And I do think that there's a, a if, we, if we can find a hopeful message in all of this, it is that these new organizations emerge to fill the vacuum left by organizations like Greenpeace and the Sierra Club. Um, and I also think, Jody, I mean, I think it's an interesting question about whether the focus on the nuclear movement, which had very yeah. clear symbology, was a core sort of like emotional um, movement um, because, of course, <laughs> the stakes were all life on Earth um, and the species conservation, right? The the powerful emotional pull of charismatic megafauna. It took a while for that to really translate to the climate movement. And it, it does so, right? Like you have the image of the polar bear on a shrinking uh, chunk of ice. Or you have, I think, and I think now very clear symbology about like the end of all life on Earth. Um, so there is still some, there's some of those older movements in the DNA of the climate movement today, I think. I, uh, by the way, a great point. And I like how you swung that towards hopeful and constructive because you are a hundred percent right i mean the naacp back in the day was mm -hmm. was transformative and then you saw the black panthers kind of rebel against the naacp you look at what's happening now and you have just stop oil and extinction rebellion and all these groups now rebelling against greenpeace and sierra club so you're you're a hundred percent right a, a little bit like the bands from the 80s and 90s that we kind of laugh at now you hear like the generation of musicians afterwards kind of cite them as influences even though we all kind of thought they were ridiculous at a certain point except fugazi of course <laughs> but um, <laughs> and public enemy yeah. all right we're gonna leave it there uh adam mckay thank you so much for doing this and thanks for joining us for two episodes in a row this is great yeah nanki and jody always love chatting thank you and nicole hammer thanks to you as always thanks jody by early September 1985, the French government was under pressure. Defence Minister Charles Arnoux denied ordering the bombing. The French agents arrested and imprisoned in New Zealand, he claimed, had simply been observing Greenpeace. But then the newspaper Le Monde dropped a bomb of its own, revealing that a third team of French combat divers had planted the explosives. It was a real political fiasco. That could have been a Watergate, a French Watergate. They could have proved that the president was uh, aware.